Hi, this lecture is going to be about clay, clay bodies, and how to go about formulating your own, own clay body recipe. Uh, I'll start out by talking just a little bit about uh, the idealized formula for clay, uh, which is right in front of me. Uh, it is something that is, is, as I said, idealized, so it doesn't actually correspond to a kind of clay in our world, but it actually um, gives us a generalized sense of what um, unifies all clays and what defines clays, despite the fact that when they're mined from the earth, they are full of other additions and contaminants that um, define specific uh, divisions between clays. So. The um, clay is basically formed of alumina hydrate or alumina oxide, silica, and um, two molecules of water. And so alumina is something that keeps materials from, it's very resistant to melting, um, very stable. Silica here is glass and water. So in this idealized state with alumina that resists melting and silica that only melts at around 3200 degrees Fahrenheit, this is not a clay that would um, vitrify or get dense anywhere near the temperatures that uh, we are firing to in a ceramic studio. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is what's the difference between a clay and a clay body. So I like to draw the analogy between uh, uh, flour and the, the, the characteristics of flour and what you can make, make by just mixing flour with, with water, which is really not much, versus what, what the ingredients might be to go into a loaf of bread or into a cake where um, flour is certainly an ingredient, but it's very dependent on all the other ingredients in the bread and in the flour or cake recipe to give the um, the cake or the bread its defining characteristics and its desirability to, to eat it. Like eating um, flour mixed with water is very, you know not nearly as fun as eating a cake. So. Um, and so we kind of use those two words a little bit interchangeably in ceramics when we say, my clay, I'm throwing with this clay. But really, when you're saying you're throwing with a particular type of clay, you're talking about a clay recipe, which is a clay body recipe. And a lot of different things go into that um, clay besides clay to make it um, have the characteristics that you are um, appreciating and desiring. So in order to make a clay body, what you desire, there's three main components. Clay, which we'll be talking about in depth. Flux, we'll talk about a little bit. And filler. So as I, when I showed you the um, formula for clay and pointed out that nothing in it melts at a very low temperature, nothing melts even near to the temperatures that we, we fire to in ceramics, um, the clay alone would not be a very strong or dense material. Uh, so the flux is, is the material that we put in a clay body to lower its melting temperature and make it usable at the temperature that you wish to fire to. And fillers are additional materials that give your clay a, a huge variety of um, fired and working characteristics that will make your, your clay um, desirable to use for your purposes. Um, so let's talk about clay first. There's three, there's five families of clays that are, um, exist in the world. Um, in your reader, there, the one type, the, the type that's called porcelain or kaolin as a category, um, is broken down into two categories. So there's primary, or residual clays, and then there's secondary or sedimentary clays. Both those categories fall into the broader umbrella of porcelain slash kaolin clays. So 
The difference between the two is that primary or residual clays are formed very close to the parent rock and all clay is formed from the process of a decomposition of granite. So primary, secondary uh, kaolins are, uh, they are formed, primary ones are formed, they are a deposit of porcelain very close to the parent rock so they just haven't um, move down say a river valley very far and the conditions have been right for that uh, the breakdown of granite to form a deposit of porcelain and that but it hasn't traveled very far one of the nice things about that is that um, usually primary clays are beautifully white so they give us like one of the main th reasons or desirable characteristics that come with porcelain and that is whiteness. Um, however, they haven't moved very far, and so they haven't been broken down very much. And so even though they all kind of look the same and feel the same to us when we run, run our fingers through um, dry clay material, um, actually uh, primary kaolins or porcelains are pretty coarse and non-plastic because of their large particle size. Um, they, they have very little uh, contaminants in them, so they're like really true whites, and they are, um, so they are like beautiful for that, and but the, alone um, as a clay, just using those, you would find a clay very, very difficult to work with because of its non-plasticity. So it's not going to be elastic and malleable. It's going to be finicky and want to crack. Um, so primary kaolins are not available in the United States. We do not have any natural deposits of them. So all we use it. Um, our main ingredient that we use in the studio which is a primary kaolin, is called Grolig or China clay. It is actually imported from England. Some other um, sources of porcelain are in, or primary porcelain are New Zealand, um, China, uh, Europe. Those are some of the ones that I really, that come to mind quickly. I'm not familiar with all the locations. However, in the um, United States, primarily in the southeast, we do have deposits of secondary kaolins. Secondary kaolins um, are, are also porcelain, but they have um, traveled further down a river valley from the granite deposit um, before they've kind of formed their, uh, a deposit that can be mined. And so they're white or sometimes off-white in color. Um, they do have smaller particle sizes as compared to primary kaolin, so they can, some of the um, types can have, um, uh, can be quite plastic. Um, they can be, uh, they can have a variety of uh, particle sizes in them, so as compared to primary kaolins or, or porcelains, they can be far more plastic. Um, these are, so the primary kaolins that we import from other countries are pretty expensive materials. So they, they um, we use them um, in some of our, our ingredients and some of our recipes in the studio. Um, particularly in Lauren's casting slip, we use a little bit of Grolig. However, we don't mix, use all Grolig, even though that, that can be done because of its expense. And so we substitute our major ingredient in Lauren's casting slip is actually tile six, which is a really nice secondary kaolin that uh, I'm not exactly sure where it comes from, but it's one of the US, mined US kaolins. Another example of a kaolin that we use a lot in the studio is EPK, um, which is, stands for Edgar uh, Plastic Kaolin. It's also a really nice one, but it doesn't make the best casting slips, so we don't tend to use it in large uh, percentages in a, in a slip casting slip. So all that stuff I was just talking about, those, that is the um, type of clay called 
porcelain or kaolin. Um, another uh, family of clay in, uh, in our clay bodies are ball clays. Now ball clays are really amazing. They also mostly are found in the southeast, um, Tennessee, um, Kentucky, that, that area. Um, but they are, um, they've moved pretty far from the pe uh, parent rock. So they, um, even though they're characterized by um, a, a, a buff or lightish color, not, not a dark iron bearing clay very much, but they, they have traveled really far and they have a very small particle size. Um, so they are a very welcome and additional to any clay body because of the plasticity that they bring to the clay. However, um, they have drawbacks is that because of their small size, they dry incredibly densely and shrink a lot and cause your clay body to be uh, prone to cracking. So you want to use them for what they bring to the clay, the clay body recipe, which is plasticity and uh, primarily plasticity and plasticity plus whiteness, which is our buff color, which is both um, desirable. Then, um, but you don't want to use too much because because those drawbacks, the high shrinkage, the prone, being prone to cracking, are all problematic. So. Uh, we tend to use in a clay body recipe no more than 20% ball clays. So the next kind of clay I'm going to talk about is fire clay. It um, matures anywhere between cone 6 and cone 22. Um, has a lot of impurities including sulfur, calcium, organic materials, mica. It can be white, buff, or red in color. It's very coarse particle size. Um, and a lot of the functions of fire clay don't, aren't um, ones that we use it for in clay bodies, but actually we use it a lot in ceramics anyway, because most you know, of our, our clay-based kiln shelves are made with fire clay, fire bricks, and many other, and soft bricks, the primary ingredient is fire clay. And sometimes it's added to a clay body, um, but typically not in really high amounts because of the coarse quality, particle size. It, it Usually fire clay is what is turned into grogs, which is a filler, which we'll get into a little bit later. All right, so stoneware clay. Stoneware clays that are a clay that historically, when people weren't ordering clays from a, a mine and having them shipped to them as we do today, the, uh, the stoneware clays were place where there was a deposit, that's where people made ceramics. Because the cool thing about stoneware clays is that they have a variety of characteristics, one of them being that they um, melt and mature almost at the temperatures that we typically fire to. So you could find a deposit of stoneware, mix it up, you know, get it ready to work, and just design a kiln that was designed to go to that temperature without the addition of flux or fillers or not much filler. So like you could just set up shop right next to a deposit of stoneware, build a kiln, make the work from directly from that deposit and fire it and it would um, mature it at a temperature that you could actually fire the kiln to. Which is not at all possible with um, fire, uh, most fire clays uh, or um, porcelains, which mature at, at a temperature hotter than what our kilns would ever fire to. So stoneware clays, you can even find a stoneware clay body recipe where it's the ingredients, you know, it's like 70% stoneware and um, only 30% other ingredients. So you don't have to have a wide distribution of um, ingredients to give it nice working qualities. Stoneware is um, characterized by having a lot of organic materials, often a fair amount of iron, but some stonewares can be buff colored and some can be pretty dark brown. Um, it's very inexpensive because of its kind of being available in a lot of different places. Uh, some of the colors that 
or brands of stoneware that that we stock are Gold Art and Foundry Hill Cream. There are some others that we don't stock at, at MSU. And then the last family of clays are called earthenwares. They mature at a pretty low temperature, so that they're what we would call a, a low fire clay. And earthenware clay is probably the widestly available across the world, um, which it covers somewhere between like 80 and 85% of the Earth's crust is earthen, there's a deposit of earthenware in it. Um, they mature from cone 04 to cone 4. Um, they can be anywhere from buff to red to almost black in color, depending on how much iron is found in that local deposit. Um, um, they have moved very far from the parent rock. So there's been a lot of wear weathering. There's been a lot of leaves decid from deciduous trees that have fallen on that deposit um, and composted and, and added organic material to the clay. Um, they, often they're pretty fine in particle size, um, but it really just depends on the local deposit. Um, it, uh, so this is the kind of clay you would see terracotta flower pots made out of, any sort of really deep rust red orange clay or, or clay is, is going to be made with a, partly with an earthenware clay. Um, the examples that are available from mines in the U.S. Our red art that we use a lot of at, at Metro State. We also stock Barnard. There are other, are other um, sources in the U.S. that we do not stock. Um, but this is also the clay that very likely you could um, find a source of, you know, not too far from where you actually live in Colorado, because you know there's there's plenty of sources for earthenware clay, including sources in your your very own backyard if you dig deep enough. Um, so how do you go from those five types of clay and knowing um, what you desire in a clay to making a, a recipe, a clay body recipe that will meet your needs? So there's a variety of things you need to be thinking about. Um, one is the temperature you want to fire to. One is the, um, the, let's see, the color you want your clay. Another thing might be your, the techniques that you're using, whether you're going to be hand building, whether you're going to be throwing, whether you're going to be slip casting. Uh, some other things to think about would be um, the scale of your work. If your work's really small, um, you could probably get away with not as much, um, uh, large particle um, additions, but if your work's really large, you're going to want the, the structure provided by uh, larger particle clays and also larger particle materials that come in the form of fillers. So those are some of the things you also might be think, want to be thinking about the atmosphere of your clay, that you want to fire your clay in, and then things such as like whether you want to do raku, because raku uh, demands some very specific things due to the fact that um, the thermal shock that it's going through during the firing process. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, knowing those five um, families of clay, knowing some of the characteristics, like that ball clay has a, lar uh, a very small particle size and it's very plastic to um, talking about how would you go about actually making a recipe that you could test and see if you like. So the first thing to know is there's the category of clay and then there's the brand that we stock. And those are, it can be really confusing because a lot of times there's an, people assume in recipes that you know what a ball clay is and that you know that when, I, when a recipe says ball clay, that you need to go to your glaze lab and find OM4 or Tennessee number four 
because those are the ball clays that we have. But that, you know, that's not always clearly delineated. So it's really important to know how to use your reader to figure that out. So if you come across a recipe, and this also happens with glaze recipes, um, they'll be like really detailed um, recipe for, for fluxes and for um, glass former, but then it'll just say 10% ball clay in your glaze recipe. And you're like, well, what's 10% ball clay? I don't see anything in the glaze lab that says ball clay. What it says is OM4 or Tennessee SGP. Well, who, um, it involves using your reader and doing research to figure that figure out that OM4 is a very common ball clay and that's probably what you should use. Or more research to find out that SGP Tennessee ball clay, um, it might be more desirable if you're wanting a really white clay because it, has, it, it behaves really similar to OM4 but it has slightly less iron. So that's where the nuance comes into this where it can get um, pretty complicated for a beginner. What I'd like to do is um, talk about the you know the three families or three parts essential parts of a, a clay body, which are clay, flux, and filler, and then um, talk about a couple recipes and um, walk through how you might go about coming up with going from a very general recipe to something very specific. So. Um, I have my whiteboard here, and what I want to work on right now is a stoneware clay body. So I know that for my stoneware, a very generalized recipe would be 60% fire or stoneware. And, but I, but I, and I don't know, but like what fire clay or what stoneware? Um, and let's say I want to throw, uh, I want to make a dark clay. So not a white stoneware, but like a buff or brownish stoneware. And I want to throw really big things with this clay. So those are two things that I'm going to add to my priorities. Throw big. And I want it to be dark. So that tells me that I want maybe to... Um, think about like choosing clays that are going to be a little bit dark and then there's going to be some tricky things I'm going to do to achieve this. Um, and of course I will not know if this is a successful recipe that I'm making until I test it. Just like with baking, you can't just like make a recipe and say, oh I know that's going to work. It, um, there's a lot of further steps to test your shrinkage, your absorption, um, try your clay for um, um, try your clay out for the, how, it, how it throws and, and the frustrating thing is, is you need to try it out right away and see if it throws well but also you need to give it time because plasticity develops a little bit of, over a few weeks so um, it may seem a little bit short or not plastic at first but in two weeks it actually that, might, that characteristic might have improved just because of aging. Um, so 60% fire stoneware. Um, I would, I'm going to say, and I want my clay dark. So I think I'm going to go for 40% gold art because it's uh, darker than um, it's darker than the the Foundry Hill cream, which is a little bit more of a buff colored clay. And then, as far as um, the as far as the fire clay, um, I'm trying to think of actually what we stock. Let's let's say Hawthorne Bond, which is pretty bad. It, it's pretty good. It's not such large particles that you can't throw with it. It's a little bit dark. It's definitely darker than the gold art, so it's going to start allowing my clay to be um, a little bit on the dark side. So let's go with this clay called Hawthorne Bond for my fire clay. So now I've chosen 40% gold art, 20% Hawthorne Bond, and 
Um, I'm hoping out of that I will get a clay that's definitely stoneware, slightly on the dark side. Um, but I also want to make sure that it's going to be easy, you know, plastic enough to throw well. So I think just out of simplicity here, I'm going to just say my ball clay is going to be OM4. It's cheap, it's available, it's very plastic, and that keeps that simple. Now, I need 10% of a feldspar, and the feldspar, or, or flux, yeah, so this I could have changed to be just the flux, and then um, that would um, tell me that these are all the clay the ingredients that are, bring different characteristics of clay to my recipe, and let me move this so you can see a little better. The ball, so I have 60% of those, 20% of ball clay, so 80% of this clay, this recipe is clay, um, three kinds of clay. And then I need to have a flux that's just gonna make sure my clay gets dense and vitrified at a low enough temperature so that I can fire it to cone 10. So, I want my clay dark though. And so the nice thing about designing clay bodies is we do need a flux, but if you go to the glaze lab, you'll see there's like 20, 30, 40 options for fluxes. But with, we keep, those are mostly things, ingredients we use in glaze, not in clay. So for a low fire clay, we'd probably just use really one option. And that's frit, frit uh, 3124. Usually for cone six, so this is low fire, or cone 04, cone six, clay body, we'd probably use nepheline cyanite, which is just a cone six flux. And then cone 10, we would probably use Custer or G200 feldspar. But I'm gonna do something slightly different. That's gonna be a, um, I hope it doesn't confuse you. But, so I need 10% flux, but I'm only gonna do 5% of, of Custer Feldspar, a high fire flux. And then because I want my clay to be dark, I'm going to um, put 5% um, Red Art clay. So Red Art is a, um, red earthenware clay which melt starts really melting strongly about cone 03 so by the time it gets to cone 10 which this clay body recipe is going to go to it's going to be a function not only as a bringer of dark color but it will also function as a flux so um, that's a little tricky i'm adding a little bit of darkness to my my clay body recipe and adding a flux in the form of a low fire clay all right, so then the last ingredient we need, I wanna add, pretty simple, is uh, flint. And flint is basically just glass. And that helps make my clay really strong, durable, and, and able to, it also reduces shrinkage because the glass melts at a much higher temperature than my clay. So it's gonna just um, also keep my clay just nice and um, strong and not able to shrink quite as much. Now, one thing that might be missing from this clay is actually um, a grog. Because if I'm trying to make this thing really big, I may want to put some grog in the clay as a filler. And that's gonna give a larger particle size that is not prone to, um, to shrinking and, or it can't shrink, because it's essentially pre-shrunk. Um, grog comes in many, many different um, particle sizes. That, and we probably have five or six, or maybe even more different versions of it. So some of them are pretty fine, and some of them are really rough and coarse, like almost even coarser than um, play sand. So I think I might need to make an adjustment to my recipe because I, so I think I'll maybe go down to 18% ball clay and I'm going to add 
of a, let's see, let's say, let's say a 60 mesh grog. And that 60 mesh, it's kind of in the middle, like the mesh of the grogs that we have go down to 20 mesh, which is very large particle, or even up to 120 mesh. So this is kind of right in the middle. I think it'll give me a little more structure to my clay, help me throw big. And um, so now I have a recipe I could go make in the lab um, and see if it's what I like. For our purposes right now, I just wanted to make sure that you understood what the difference was between a clay and a clay body and get just the beginning sense of um, the factors that go into uh, designing a clay body. Now, it would be very different if I was trying to make a, a low fire clay or a white low fire clay or a porcelain. I've just chosen to talk about stoneware today. So I really encourage you to talk to me if you have questions about what, what are the characteristics and the generalized structure of what you might have if you were to have a low fire white clay versus like a, a high fire porcelain clay. How would I change this clay if I was going from a, um, going from one, having a dark clay that was for making large things to how would I change that recipe if I just, I wanted a whiter stoneware? Like what were the, would be the adjustments I make? Those are kind of things you can research, um, but I really encourage you to ask me or your teacher um, how, how to do that. Now, I do want to clarify that with our technical lab this semester, I, we are not going to be making clay bodies in the lab. We are going to be working on um, decorating slips. So uh, I did want to give you some idea of, of the kind of factors that go into making a clay body, but we are actually going to be making slips, not clay bodies this semester. But if you have an interest to do it on your own, don't hesitate to speak with me and we'll We'll make that happen. Uh, I am going to do another short video just talking about plasticity of clay, what causes plasticity, and um, and so look for that. That will be the the video that you should watch following this particular one on clays and clay body.